Test a one, two. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a wonderful morning. So nice to see everybody here. We have a nice service plan today. We're talking about the meek will inherit the earth. We're talking, the title is the mighty meek today. But we're going to start up with some worship right now. We have the drawing giveaway today also. And we're going to start right now. So let's stand together. We're going to start with a song called Happy. Happy. Hey, because we're happy. Here we go.
place with your spirit. We are so thankful, Lord, for you. Praise your holy name. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you so much. Well, right now it is time for some scripture. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 19. Praise the Lord. I'm going to be explaining that today as we talk about the meek will inherit the earth. Praise. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thought. Can we have our ushers come forward here today? It's our time for giving as we sing a hymn called His Name is Wonderful.
Peters. <laughs> Oh, 
look like you're waiting for a handshake, don't <laughs> yeah. Ah. Just for just for a little FYI, we're ready to build flash and run through here to make sure all the heaters are off. Let's see it again. And the window was open even there. Twice the heater was on in there. So I mentioned it to Dennis. She said, no, it was no, it was me. And boy, I got house school. Yeah, he did. That's when he was free. How are you this morning? I'm doing good. Oh, I'm sorry. So much last night I I what's going on? Oh, what did you do? Oh, yeah. Practice and I was trying to get ready to sit down. Oh, thank you. Oh, no. I didn't even know that. Oh, the last one I knew about is the very stopped at my door down there and grabbed me and brought me down here. <laughs> oh, well, next time. <laughs>
And they all scolded him, but his smile remained on his face because he said, this is a very special coffee cake, he explained. I accidentally drove by the bakery this morning and there was a window, in the window, there was a host of all these cookies and goodies and things. And I felt it was no accident, so I prayed. I said, Lord, if you want me to have one of those delicious coffee cakes, let me find a parking place directly in front of the bakery. And sure enough, on the eighth time around, I found one. <laughs> the eighth time around. Yeah. Eight stands for new beginnings, anyway, but I don't know about that, anyway. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. I have a couple prayer requests here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the message that you've given. We thank you for all who have come today, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just anoint this service and anoint this message, Lord. But, Lord, we just pray to hold up. We want to hold up certain ones to you. Right now, Donnie and Donna are gone to pick up uh, um, their sister, his sister, who is uh, having a problem with cancer right now, but is just can't think about it all because her grandchild, Orek, is in the... Uh, um, at the Portland Hospital and he's on life support and they're just about ready trying to make the decision whether they should pull the plug or not and so I don't know where they are along on that but Lord I pray that you would just bless that family and just help this have some closure and help it uh, just just work a miracle in this situation I pray for healing for or but if it's not in your will Lord I pray for comfort for all of those who love him and are worried and are so concerned Lord it's such a hard time to lose somebody that's so young. And so, Lord, he, like he's 13 and stuff. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless that whole family. Also, Lord, I want to hold up Beverly's friend, John, who drives on here. And his, his uh, dad just passed away. And so I, I pray for comfort for John. And uh, all those that knew his dad and loved him, Lord, I pray that they would be comforted through all of this. And I pray that this situation would just help them Think on you more, Lord, and just seek you with a whole heart. And so, Lord, through all these things, I pray that you are exalted. And, Lord, for this service today, I pray that you're exalted. And, and I just pray that you would just put some fire in the message, Lord, to help people change their character and become the people that you want them to be. And so, Lord, we turn it over to you right now. We ask for these blessings, and we ask for these things in your precious name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Today we're talking about the mighty me. Over in the Middle East, there is a, out in the Mediterranean, there is a beautiful island there. Maybe some of you have visited it before. It's the island of Crete. And this island is called, in Greek, Macarius. Macarius, and it's a word that's translated blessed or blessed. And so there is an island that is named blessed. And the reason that they named the Crete uh, Crete, Macarius, rather, is because they thought that it, everything it had it had everything it needed to sustain life. It was completely self-contained. There was enough vegetation, and there was enough food, enough grain, enough water, and there was enough of everything to sustain life. Now, not only did they have enough for themselves, but they were able to even export stuff. And so the Greeks named this island Macarius, or blessed, blessed, blessed. And we're going to read some uh, Beatitudes right now. And in these Beatitudes, they begin with the same word, Macarius, or blessed. And that should give some idea about what the word blessing really means. Now, for one thing, it means more than happy. Now, some translate it happy, but it means more than happy because it means having everything that you need. That is better than just being happy. You see, I think of that having everything you need is going to be a bigger thing, and that is what it means to be blessed. You have everything that you need, and this is what blessings really do. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us the Beatitudes, and, or attitudes, that ought to be for us. And so, they're not platitudes, but they are attitudes, and really they deal with Christian character. I'm constantly talking about Christian character. Now listen to me, Christian character is what you are. Christian character is what you are. Your reputation is what others think about you. But character is what God and your wife or husband know about you. <laughs> and this deals with character now. So it is not blessed what men have, and it's not blessed what men do, but it's blessed what men are. 
Because, friend, all of us are going to die one day. And some of us, sooner than we think, and when you die, you're going to leave behind all that you have and all that you have done, and you're going to take with you all that you are. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah right. Just all that you are. And so it's character that we're talking about, and this is what's so important to the Lord. Now, that's the reason that it is more important to seek blessedness than it is happiness. You see, most people in the world, what are they doing? They're seeking happiness because they want to be happy. Did you know that there are those who are looking for happiness? Now, this is on your outline. The ones that are looking for happiness are the most find it the least. When you're looking for happiness, you will find it the least. And that's a strange thing, but it's absolutely true. A lot of things in the Bible are kind of opposite the way human nature feels. But it's absolutely true. People who are on the search for happiness are generally the most unhappy people in the world. You see, happiness is not something that you find by looking for it. Happiness is something that you stumble over when you are seeking, on your outline, blessedness. Happiness is something you, you stumble over when you're seeking blessedness. Friend, if you seek happiness, you'll never find it. But if you get right with God, and on your outline, blessedness will find you. And it'll run you down. And it will bring happiness to you. This is what Jesus Christ is trying to talk about here in the Beatitudes. And he's talking about blessedness. So let's go ahead and look at it right now in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. <clears throat> and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now that is our verse today. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You talk about an inheritance. Now just think about what it means to inherit the earth. Let's think about that. When I was a little boy, there was a program on called uh, In Search for the Missing Heirs. You remember that? Some of the older people, yeah. They would have a, uh, a, a, somebody died and they left a lot of money and nobody knew who it belonged to. And so there was a great big search for the missing heirs. And it might be, dear friend, that you are one of the missing heirs, the one that is going to inherit the earth. And yet you don't even know it. I hope today that you hear your name being called, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, what does it really mean? What does it mean? What is this beatitude? Well, today uh, we're going to talk about the mighty meek. The mighty meek. Now, if there's one thing that this world would say is not blessed, would be meekness. The world doesn't feel like meekness is blessed at all. They don't think that meekness is a blessing at all. And people in this world would say, blessed are the mighty men, or blessed are the muscle men, or blessed are the mental men, or blessed are the money men. In fact, blessed any kind of man except for a meek man. Because we think of meekness on your outline as weakness. So often we think of meekness as weakness, but the Bible says, blessed are the meek, for they're going to inherit the earth. Well, what is meekness exactly? First, I will tell you what it is not. Before I tell you what it is, it is not weakness. Remember that big, plain, and straight? Meekness is not weakness. If you think that meekness is weakness, you go weak. I mean, you go weak trying to be meek, and you will find out that meekness <laughs> is not weakness. You know? you know what Jesus said in Matthew 11? He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. For I am meek and lowly of heart. Now, do you think of Jesus as meek? Do you think of him as weak? No, no, no. Jesus says, I am meek. And do you think he was really weak? No. Do you remember Jesus was weak? You've got to remember that he spent 40 days and 40 nights alone out in the wilderness without any with the wild beasts. And if you think that Jesus was weak, he was the one that made the whip and drove the money changers out of the temple. Do you think he was weak? When he said that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? 
Well, it doesn't sound like he was that weak, you know. These pictures of Jesus that make him look like they came out of a beauty parlor and stuff, they're enough to make me sick, really, because they don't really show the strength and the mightiness of our Lord. Yeah. Jesus was a man, and he was a strong man, and he said, I am meek. And this is what he said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Now, back in the Old Testament in Exodus, do you know who in his day was, the Bible said, was the meekest man in the Old Testament? It was Moses. Moses was the meekest man on the earth. That's what it says. Of all the men on the earth, Moses was the meekest. And that's before Jesus Christ got here, of course. And he was more than a man. But do you think that Moses was a wimp, really? I mean, you study the life of Moses. I mean, he got in trouble sometimes because of his temper. But the thing is, he was not a weak man. He was a general. And he was a general that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He was no wimp. And meekness is not weakness. So what is weakness? Well, it's not cowardliness. It's not a milk toast or a type of character. That's not meekness, weakness. But the definition for the word meekness on your outline means yielded. Yielded. To yield. It literally has the idea on your outline of strength under control. Meek doesn't mean weak. It means strength under control. You know, there was a man named J. Wallace Hamilton who wrote a book called Ride the Wild Horses. And uh, the title of the book, he points out that when God created us and when God put us together, God put in our nature certain drives and certain instincts and certain ambitions. And they are not evil in of themselves. But these drives and these ambitions and these instincts need to be yielded in our lives. They need to be yielded. And he pointed out different ways. And what I want to point out is the word meekness has the idea of like a wild stallion that is broken. I mean, in a matter of fact, in his day, in that day, sometimes still in this day, when a steed or an animal or a horse or anything has been domesticated and being able to be trained and stuff, the rider is able to sit on his back and they can pull a plow and everything like that. The proper term for that horse or that animal is that, or that oxen is that it was meeked. It is meek. It's still, it had been meek. It doesn't mean it loses its strength or anything, but it had been broken. It had been broken. And it yields to the rider and it yields to the yoke. And ultimately is strength under control. And it means it's a compliant spirit. Now you see that these beatitudes come in order. So let's look at it here before we get to meekness. First of all, the first and step is blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, my friend, that shows on your outline our condition. And we say within myself that when I am naked in front of a holy God, I am spiritually bankrupt. There's no good thing in me. He sees right through me. And so I realize my condition in that I'm poor in spirit. And then I'm exposed. And then next, blessed are they that mourn. And so, because of our condition, and that means after our condition comes mourning. And so, the mourn shows on your outline, next is our contrition. We're broken hearted, our contrition, we're contrite heart. And then you say, well, God have mercy on me, I see what I am, I weep over it, I truly repent of it, and we become broken. And then after that condition, after that contrition is, on your outline, his control. And that's how you get under that control. And then I am meeked. Where I take myself now, and now, my Lord, I place myself under your control. And that's what we do. We have a new master, and we seek him for everything. And we think on him before we make any decision, because we are meek and we belong to him. I am controlled now by the Lord. I have a new master that I serve. Now, a horse that has been meek still has the same strength. It still has the same fire, still has the same drive, still has the same instincts and everything. But now, there's a bit and a bridle and a saddle. You know, J. Wallace Hamilton talked about a few ways that you might deal with a wild horse. And one of the first ways that he said that you could do is that you could let the horse run wild. And this is pretty much what we have done in America, a generation that has done that. I mean, how we deal with this is what we call no restraint and self-assertion. But America has just basically let the horses run wild, you know. 
And whatever is natural is beautiful. Whatever is beautiful, then it must be right. And so you just do your own thing, and it must be good. And that's self-assertion, and that's following your heart's desire. But you don't put any restraint on yourself. If you, if you want to get drunk, you just get drunk. If you want to fornicate, you can fornicate. If you want to fight, you can just fight. There is no self-restraint. And the chief apostle of this philosophy of yesterday, of, on your outline, no restraint, is a man named Nietzsche. And he influenced the world far more than we realize. As a matter of fact, a student of Nietzsche was, on your outline, Adolf Hitler. And let me tell you about what Adolf Hitler said about letting the horses run wild. He said this, and listen to this quote, Get rid of your pious priests and their weak-livered gospel of mercy. Purge out your souls this disease, this devil of Christianity, because progress depends on the strong man and the strong people. Therefore, be strong, assert yourself, and be a superman. Well, Hitler read that and quoted that right there from Nietzsche and stuff. And Hitler said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make myself a super race. And of course, the results of it was the gas ovens and the Holocaust and the Second World War that some went through. But that's one way to deal with wild horses. Just let them run. Just assert yourself and do your thing. And the devil takes the high notes because that is his path. Do your own thing. Lean on your own understanding. Now there's the opposite of that, and that's not self-restraint, self-release, excuse me, but it is self-restraint. It is not self-release, but it is self-restraint. While others, and some are saying they want to let the horses just run wild, there are others that want to cripple the horse. They want to hobble the horse so that they can run where they can't run at all. <coughs> excuse me. That is, on your outline, Buddhism. Buddhism is like that. Have you ever seen that uh, fat Buddha sitting there and he, with this place of book on his faith? That's Buddha, and that's a philosophy. The thing that causes your difficulty is that you have certain desires and you get frustrated when these desires are not met. Now, we understand that. And what you've got to do is simply negate these desires, and what you do is somehow dampen that spirit until you come to the place where you don't desire anything at all. Well, I've kind of gotten to the place where I don't desire the same things I used to desire, but I desire serving the Lord. But they put themselves in a place where they don't uh, desire anything. And they just put yourself in, you know, so they're never disappointed. And uh, basically, in their mind is what they do, and they put in themselves in a state of nirvana. That's what nirvana is. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I can just go, mm, and not need anything. And stuff. But that's not Bible Christianity, though. That's no more Christianity than letting the horses run wild. So ultimately, you don't let the horse run wild. You don't cripple the horse either because God gives us, on our outline, our heart's desire in Christ. I can still like my music and like preaching and like things, but it's all for the Lord now. And God gives us our heart's desire in Christ. With Christ, now my heart wants to seek Christ on your outline and share it. And I mean more than all my old desires are sought. And it's interesting how the Lord did that. And He changed that. I didn't change it. He changed it. And some people think, oh, I could be so holy if I could just go be in a monastery somewhere and wear a holy robe and do a chant and stuff, and then I'd be so holy. But there's no holiness in a hole. And I tell you what, that we are called to live a holy life in an unholy world. Because we are called to be an example. And God wants you to be a light. And so what is Jesus saying then? Jesus is not saying let the horse run wild. He's not saying cripple the horse. What Jesus is saying is blessed are the meek. Huh? Let's, let me give you a verse. In Romans 6, verse 19. Look what it says here. In 6, 19 it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the affirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, cleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So we're talking about your eyes and your ears and your hands and your tongue. We are no longer slaves to Satan and stuff because we are bond slaves to Christ now. And you know what a bond slave is? Remember you went to debtor's prison, you became a slave for somebody and you had to be there for a certain amount of years till the debt was paid and the years were up and all of a sudden they could go home and they said, I don't want to go home. I'd rather be a servant and a slave of them than back at my own place. So they become a bond servant. 
means that they're a bond slave, and that means that they chose to be a slave because the slave master was so wonderful to them, they didn't want to leave. That's what we are to Jesus. We are bond slaves to Jesus, and our master is so wonderful, we don't want to leave. And that means as you used to be yielded to Satan, though, leaning on your own understanding, you are to yield your members, servants, to righteousness into holiness. That's what our goal should be. That should be our focus. That's what it means when you yield. That's That meekness means it is strength under control. Using the same members, using your hands and your eyes and your ears and your tongue. But now, rather than using my tongue to blaspheme, I use my tongue to pray and to practice self-control. I still have my ambitions, but now my ambition is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives me energy. It gives me joy. I'm still a fighter. I still am fighting, fighting, but now I'm fighting the devil. I've changed my focus. I'm fighting that crowd because I'm learning of Jesus from his word. And it is strengthening me up to look at the world through his eyes. And God is not going to hobble the horse. He energizes it. He puts the bit on. He puts the bridle on. He puts the saddle on. And he says, blessed are those on your outline who have yielded. Blessed are those who have yielded for me. So tell me, have you ever yielded? I mean... Have you ever really yielded totally? And that's just one thing that we really don't want to do. And sometimes we really don't even know what areas that would be in. I pointed out a few of them. I wrote down a few of them. Things that we need to do. Are you yielded or are you lukewarm? Are you yielded or are you lukewarm? Do you support your local church? Is the attendance your priority? Because you love what Jesus loves, the saints. Do you refrain from your vices because you long to be holy? Do you control your language? Or does your language change when you get around secular people? Do you tithe 10% of your money that God has blessed you with? Do you give 14% of your time to do the work of God to further the kingdom? Do you share the gospel and make people yearn for your lifestyle? Do you pray with your family regularly? Are you yielded in obedience to God's Word? Yeah, you can go on and on and on. There's so much, and there's only so much that we can find and do, but we're supposed to be doing the best, looking for those areas, how we might grow and please the Lord. We need to do it more than anyone else because we are the light. There's a story of a pastor. He was driving along and he saw a drunk and he was staggering along the way. And by the way, the drunk is not a funny thing. It's not to be laughed at. It is more to be wept over. But the pastor, he thought he recognized him, and he did. And he stopped the car, and he said, Son, get in. And so he got in. And the pastor said, Can I take you home? And he said, Yes, pastor. And so he drove up to the house of that drunken boy and brought him in the house, and his dad and mother were there. And they were so embarrassed. But the pastor had, bring, had to bring the drunken son home. And they took him in, and they put him in bed. And the pastor started to leave, and the dad stopped him. And he said, Pastor, can I talk to you? And he said, well, yes. And he said, Pastor, I'm so embarrassed that you brought my son home drunk. He said this, but he's not the only drunk in the family. He said, I'm a drunk too. And I don't know what to say to this boy, because I'd be a hypocrite if I told him to stop drinking, because I am a drunkard. And the pastor said, well, why don't you quit drinking? And, the pa and he said, well, I want to tell you this, Pastor. You might not believe it. He said, I want to tell you that I hate liquor. I hate it, but I can't stop. He said, I don't have what it takes. I just can't stop. And of course, the pastor's heart broke for him. And he said, have you ever dream driven a team of horses? And the pastor knew that he was an old fella that he probably had. And he did say, yes, yes, I've driven a team of horses. And the pastor said, well, if you were driving a team of horses and they were wild horses and they were getting away from you and you were afraid for your life and you couldn't make them stop and you couldn't rein them in and sitting next to you there in that wagon was someone that was there that knew, you knew, they knew how to do it and it was someone that could control them, what would you do? And he said, well, pastor, that's easy. I'd turn the reins over to him. And the pastor said, that's the only thing I know to tell you to do. He says, to simply just, Lord Jesus, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm going to quit trying, and I'm going to start trusting. And simply just turn the reins over to him, because, my friend, those horses are wild horses. 
And there's only one that I know that can tame them. And he is not going to want to cripple them. And he's not going to want them to run wild. But what he wants is strength under control. And that's the meaning of meekness. That's what it means. And I want you to look with me at not only the meaning and the definition of meekness, but I want you to see how that you can have meekness in your life. And what I mean is how do you develop this kind of meekness? We know that Jesus said, blessed are the meek, but where do we get it? Where do we get this meekness? Now remember, there's a sequence. First of all, you got to see yourself as poor in spirit, absolutely bankrupt with all your shortcomings, and be fair and be honest about that. And then secondly, you're brokenhearted over it, and you weep. And dear friends, if you haven't been broken, you don't know the Word of God. You're never going to be on your outline meek if you've never been broken. And you see, a meek horse is a horse that has been broken. You know, we sit in our churches so heady and high-minded, unbent and unbroken, and somehow getting the idea that we've done God a favor by just showing up at church. And then we walk out, we never really ever even see our broken condition. And we're never mourning over our sin, and maybe never ever even seeing it with no contrition at all. And therefore, we never are healed our lives completely and totally to Jesus Christ. Because you have to come to that point where you submit everything to Him. Now today, if you're ready to yield your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you three steps to develop some meekness. First of all, you must be, on your outline, submitted to the Son of God. Let's read it in Matthew 11, 28-30. It says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he says, take my yoke upon you. Well, what is that? Listen, think of this. An oxen that has uh, the yoke has been meeked already. Okay, think about that. The oxen with the yoke has been meek already. So you see it in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. I am meek and lowly at heart. Now here we have a picture of two oxen. And they are pulling together. And the yoke is on one. And the yoke is on the other. And so these two oxen are side by side. They're pulling and that's like us. Here we have Jesus Christ is saying, I want you to take my yoke upon you. So it's no longer only you alone now. It's you on your outline and Jesus. So now when you take his joke on, it's you and Jesus pulling together. And Jesus says, therefore you follow me and take my yoke upon you and learn of me and from me, for my yoke is easy. Easy. Ooh, it's not easy when you've been down the wrong road. But it is easy when you do it because what easy means there, that definition means that the yoke fits right. doesn't mean that all that you do for Jesus is going to be easy. But it fits right. It feels good on the yoke. And it fits right. You see, Christianity is not something that you have to do on your outline. It is something you get to do. Yes. When you put that yoke on, it feels right. Amen. And that God loves you so incredibly, He says, my yoke is easy. And I've heard people say, oh, it's hard to be a Christian, though. But my friend, that is a lie. You know, you just have to refrain from doing all the things that you got hooked to, maybe. And that's what the problem is. But it is easier because the Christ wants you just to be focused on Him. The Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And that is true. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. That's why it's so important to find Jesus when you're young. So important for the share it with the young so they don't go down a wrong road and have a hard time making their way back to the Lord. But the Lord can do anything and He can cure anything. He can do anything. All things are possible with Him. But basically, when you get that yoke on, it doesn't mean that you don't pull. It doesn't mean that there's no work to do. He didn't say that my, my yoke is lazy. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. My friends, first of all, you're going to be meek. There's a decision that you're going to have to make if you're going to be. And it's this. God will not force you to take this yoke. You can say no if you wish. 
Because there's not enough angels in heaven or out of heaven that can, on your outline, that can force you to come. There is not enough angels that can force you to come. There's not enough demons in hell or out of hell that can keep you from coming. God has made it possible for our own choice to have power in it. And there is not a preacher in the world that can preach you down this aisle. Because if I could do it, it wouldn't do you any good. Whatever I could talk you into, somebody else could talk you out of. And it is a decision that you have to make on your own. And you're going to have to make that decision yourself to take the yoke of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to take it by your own will. And did you know that when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, it's a command? It's a command. You can refuse it if you wish, just like any command. You can refuse it. That's your privilege. And you see, I can tear my heart out and beg you to come to Jesus Christ and you're going to have to take His yoke and do His will. And also, you're going to have to learn of Him before you're ever going to be broken. Because you need to come with a contrite heart before you will be in the right place. Now there comes a time when you're going to have to make a decision to do it. And Jesus says, come unto me today. Now is the time. Now is the time. He didn't say to come to a denomination either. He didn't say to come to churchianity. He's not talking about a creed. He's saying, come unto me and you'll find rest for your souls. Don't you ever let the devil try to get you thinking negatively about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way to blessedness and meekness on your outline is the way to inherit the earth. Yes. And we want to inherit the earth. <coughs> That's one of our rewards. And I want it. <laughs> and not only, my friend, must you be submitted to the Son of God, but I want to tell you something else. That if you would be meek today also, secondly, on your outline, you must be responsive to the Word of God. Look what it says in James 1.21 here. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. Now, it says, humbly accept the word planted in you, or receive it with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Your, the word is able to save your soul. The word soul there is the word suke in Greek. And suke means psyche. So we would be able to say, able to save your psyche. And that's what that means. So you could say, to receive it with meekness, the word will save your psyche. Huh. And do you want to be meek? Well, do you know what meekness is? It's submission to a higher power. We all have to answer to someone. We all have an authority we answer to. And you are just submitting to a higher power. And not only must you receive the Son of God, but you must respond to the Word of God. And that's how you receive with meekness. Uh, with respect and uh, uh, responding to the Word is what you need to do. And so... This is what we see. So let the Word of God be your control, your guidebook. Let the Word of God be your bridle and be your bit and receive with meekness the engrafted Word that's able to save your soul. Now look at the word receive there. One version says accepted when you receive accepted. Actually, there are two Greek words there for receive that I broke down. And one of them is lombano. The first Greek word lombano means it's sort of a self-prompting taking. And it has the idea of grasping and reaching out and snatching. And frankly, there are some people that they try to learn the Bible that way. And they say, well, I'm going to study the Bible. And so they get themselves a readable Bible and they get themselves a Bible dictionary and then a concordance and a commentary and then a yellow legal pad and a pen and they sit down at the desk and they say, I'm going to learn the Bible. And so and you might learn some facts about the Bible, but you're not going to learn God's Word that way. Not until you receive it with meekness, ready to be taught, to do what it says. It takes a brokenness to finally seek it with a whole heart. When you seek the Lord with a whole heart, you will find Him and stuff. Now, you might know all the names of all the kings of Israel, and you might know all the Bible chronology and everything. You might know it all, dear friend, but if you're not meek, you cannot receive the Word spiritually. And so many people I see understand the Bible, theology people and people I know that they've read the Bible and know the Bible, but they have not received it into their heart because the Bible is alive. But to the unsaved, it's just another book. It might not even be true to the unsaved. 
but we have experienced it. We have felt it. We know it's alive, and it is working in our lives. The Word of God is alive. Yes. And what these people have done when they get in the Word and they try to find all these facts and figures is simply lambano. What they have done is lambano. They've gone into the Word of God and tried to snatch out some truth, and so many do that. And maybe they do it for their pride. Maybe they do it so they can know more than somebody else. Or maybe so they can show themselves as a teacher or something. But dear friend, you will not know the Word of God because your spirit has never been broken. And that's what turns you into the Christian you need to be. There's another word that, or the word receive in Greek, and it's called dikomi. And that's the word that's used here. And do you know what it means? It means to welcome with humility. That is to welcome it with humility and humbly accept. Accept it. Not to take, but to welcome. You know, have you ever sat down to read the Bible prepared to do everything that it said? Mm, that's pretty big there. I mean, not just praying the Word of God past the judgment of your mind to make it up, whether it's right or whether it's wrong or whether you think it's, it's interesting. The Word of God is not meant to be interesting on your outlines. It is meant to be disturbing. It is meant to change you. It is meant to be disturbing. And you know, it reminds me of these two words for the mono and Dikomi. A pastor went to China to preach in China. And he was over there and he was talking about it at a thing I was listening to. And he was there was a crusade there and he learned, he said one thing, that when you go to a Chinese home, that you'll find that the Chinese are some of the most hospitable people at, that there is anywhere in the world. And that they will not allow you to come into their house unless they serve you something. And you should never go into a Chinese house without receiving something from their hand. And when they bring you refreshments or whatever, if it's a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is, you never reach out with one hand and take it. You take both hands and bow and take a sip, at least take a sip. You grab it with both hands. And when you reach out with one hand, it has the idea of grasping, lambano. And to reach with both hands, it has the idea of receiving, humbly receiving, dikomi, humbly accepting. So friends, it's the same way with us. When we let go of this world and with both hands, and we reach out both hands to Jesus Christ, as you study the Word of God, ready to obey, and to receive with meekness the engrafted Word that is able to save your soul and deliver your psyche, you will be filled with blessedness. You see... You can read your owner's manual of your car, but when your car is broken, you really read it, and you can fix your car. But there's third thing, not only to receive Jesus, but submit to Jesus, the Son of God, and not only to bring your life under submission and to receive the Word of God, ready to obey it, but dear friend, next, thirdly on your outline, be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. In Galatians 5, <laughs> verses 21 and 22, it says, A fruit of the Spirit is meekness. Fruit of the Spirit is meekness. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And when you say, Lord Jesus, I put your yoke upon me. And when you say to the Word of God, I receive this Word with meekness. And when you say to the Spirit of God, please work in me. I tell you, the Holy Spirit of God produces meekness. He produces meekness when you submit to the Lord. It's the fruit of the Spirit in submission. Listen, you don't produce that fruit. You don't produce fruit. You just, on your outline, bear the fruit. You just bear the fruit. He produces the fruit. When you start to produce it, you can't produce fruit. You only can let Him flow through you to produce the fruit. You only bear the fruit. And when you walk in the Spirit, you will, it's then that meekness will be in your heart and in your life and stuff. And then you'll really understand that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now I've talked to you about the definition of it, and also I've talked to you about the development of it. <coughs> so let me talk to you for a moment about the dynamics. I mean, what is the dynamic of meekness? Well, it's blessed are the earth. I mean, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit, is on your outline. We will inherit the earth. And this is a big deal. You know, have you ever daydreamed about the inheritance, having an inheritance? I always think about that story about the guy sitting on the curb crying, and somebody said, why are you crying? And he said, well, I was reading the newspaper that Rockefeller just died. He's the richest man in the world. And they said, well, what are you crying for? He's not a relative of yours. And he said, well, that's why I'm crying. <laughs> 
could use that money here. Well, all of us kind of dream about having an inheritance. And it said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that is the dynamic of it, inheriting the earth. And so what does it mean? Let me tell you, dear friends, that you will never have your full inheritance without meekness. You're not going to inherit it without meekness. The meek will inherit the earth. Listen, a man cannot control himself and be controlled by the Spirit of God is never satisfied. A man that can't control himself is never satisfied. And what does he mean when you're going to inherit the earth? Well, because not only it speaks of now, but also it speaks of hereafter, wouldn't sweep by and by, but how can you inherit it now? It's saying now we inherit the earth. Right now, look what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.21. It says this here. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. That's mine. Yours and mine. All things are ours. Do you believe that? you believe it? I hope so. Oh, yeah. It's in the Word of God. I believe it in my head, but I've never got it in my heart, I don't think. All things are mine. All things are yours. Let's carry on. 22 and 23. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's, we belong to Christ, and Christ is God's. Christ belongs to God, and God, Christ is God. Let's go ahead and keep that in mind. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10. It says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. I don't care what you have. If you don't have blessedness, you can't enjoy it because blessedness does not come in things. I don't care what you don't have because I'm, it's saying that if you have blessedness, you have everything. If you have blessedness, you have everything. If you're completely happy and content serving the Lord, you have everything. And it's so strange, but it's true. You do. But listen, what can the devil do to a person like this that understands it like that. He says in this verse, all things are yours on your outline as having nothing, yet possessing all things. You see, the devil comes to you. Now remember, you know how the devil will come. He's what? He comes in either as a roaring lion on your outline to terrify you, or he will come as an angel of light to entice you. That means trick you. And so first of all, let's say the devil comes as a roaring lion. Okay, the devil says, if you don't follow me, I'm going to take everything from you. And you say, devil, well, you can't take anything from me on your outline because I don't have anything. I don't have anything. And that's how you should feel. And what it says here is having as having nothing on your outline. I don't have anything. So how are you going to take anything from me when I don't have anything? The devil says, okay, well, I guess that's not going to work. I'll tell you what to do. I'm going to not come as a roaring lion. I'm going to come as an angel of light. Okay, if you follow me and lean on your own understanding, he says, I'll give you this and this and this. All you got to do is do it. And you say, well, devil, how are you going to give me anything? Because on your outline, I already have everything. I already have everything. Everything I need, what's he going to do? As having nothing, yet possessing all things. What can the devil do to a person like that? On your outline, all things are yours. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I'm saying not only, dear friend, in this life, but in the world to come. Now, have you ever thought about that prayer that we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Well, I'll tell you right now that there is coming a time when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. And it will be just like this poem says. And Jesus shall reign from where the sun doeth his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till the moon shall wax and wane no more. The branches will bend down with fruit the plains will wave with grain. The lamb will, and the lion will lie down together and the saints will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. You see, he didn't make this for the devil's crowd. He made this for his people. The meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, I don't know what side that you're on, but I want to light up on his side. 
I want to find myself bankrupt and I realize there's no good thing in me. I want to find myself spiritually broken and destitute with a contrite heart. I need God and I need Him. He need Him to sanctify me, making me into the person I need to be. Justified means He's been forgiven my sins and everything. Sanctified means that He is working it out in me and making me to be the person that I am to be. And I want to see myself that way. Broken and destitute, I want to weep over it because now I understand that I want, that the Lord Jesus, as best I know, I yield myself to Him. And I'm going to take my yoke and I'm going to be meek. And believe that word that I am led by your spirit so we will inherit the earth now and forever. Because blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Oh, the mighty, mighty meek. Praise God for the mighty me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, of your word. And Lord, I just pray that it helps us once again to build character and help us to become the people that you want us to be. Help us to see our opportunities. Help us to step up to the plate and want to do all the things that, the, that your word tells us, Lord. Help us to be those people that would make you proud, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you again for your word, and we just pray that you would just touch the hearts of everybody and just bless them real good. And so we thank you again for this time and your word, Lord. We thank you so much and ask for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Okay, well, we have one last song, and uh, don't get real riled up on me, but I'm going to let you out early today. And, uh, no. Oh, no. Add a little more to it. <laughs> that's, that's really sweet, darling. <laughs> We're going to sing a song here. Let's stand together and sing, Father, I Adore You. Here we go. us every day, Lord, to pray and, and seek your guidance for the day. And Lord, as we pray, I, I pray that you would just help everybody count their blessings, especially count their blessings and look back and see what the Lord has done for them and, and to seek you with a whole heart, Lord. Well, I just thank you for everybody being here and I just pray that you would just work your life out in their life and just bless them in such a big way, Lord. Bless them really good. And so, Lord, send them back next week and let them have a great week this week. So once again, Lord, we thank you for everything and we ask for all of these things. In your precious name we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. 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 Go with God. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming. We have a nice message for you next week. <laughs>